Well, hello and good day again to you, my friends. And we are now going to look at the workers' great privilege. This particular message, this particular area of teaching is the second part uh, of two parts. Part one was the workers' commission. And I would encourage you to go back to that particular session and to take a look at that because that sets a really good foundation and basis for what we're looking at today. Although today's session is shorter than the first one on the Workers' Commission. Today we are going to be looking at the workers' great privilege. To set a foundation for you today, for you to be able to look into the scripture, you may want to look at 2 Chronicles 4 and verse 23. And I'm going to read to you from the New King James Version, where it says, There were potters and those who dwell at Netaim and Gedarah. There they dwelt with the king for his work. We're going to pray together before I start in any proper way because we need the anointing of the Spirit of God to rest upon us and we need the enabling and we need the quickening and we need the illumination that only the Holy Spirit is able to bring for us to understand the mind and the heart of God. And so let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we seek after you today and we do you, Lord Jesus, for the help and the work of the Holy Spirit upon our minds and upon our hearts. Lord, your word is unintelligible. It is a, a inspiration, yes. It is something that comes from heaven, yes. And Lord, in our natural minds, we just cannot understand or perceive what your heart and mind is. But we ask for the work of the Holy Spirit today as we go through our teaching today and ask that you will challenge our hearts, that you will bless our spirits and that you will encourage us in our service for you. And therefore, we hand ourselves over to you, Holy Spirit of God, to first glorify the Lord Jesus and to secondarily implant your word into our hearts and minds and cause us to be a people who serve you willingly and gladly. And that Lord, even at the smallest whisper of the voice of God to our hearts, we will be responsive to you. And we ask that you'll help us to that end in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to say that there is a fairly well-known expression and it is still around in the church today, albeit it's losing its flavour, if you like, amongst the majority of today's church. And it is this, that we are saved to serve. In the past, this was a considerably used expression and it denoted the initial posture that all born-again Christians were expected to adorn and take to themselves. It was an expression of gratitude to the Lord for dying on the cross and bringing all of us to his salvation. It was also an attitude of heart that said, from your mouth to my hands, as the slaves in the Roman Empire would say to their masters, and as I explained in some depth in session number one, the Workers' Commission. And it is also the proper pathway for the Christian as they start on to their pathway of faith. You know, in the past decade or more, it has unfortunately been replaced in the greater part of Christendom. And as a whole, by the church, recognising that saved to serve, that expression became a syndrome that they believe was smacked of serving Christ in accordance with the letter of the law, instead of in the spirit. The result has been that the church has leaned the other way. And now the service aspect has taken very much a backseat role in the thinking and mentality of many individual Christians. It's not the fault of those who are in the sheepfold, as it were, however. The fault lays squarely at the feet of those who are called of God 
those who are the shepherds that God has appointed to his church and given as Ephesians 4 tells us. And there are many reasons for that, but they're not the subject of this time together, however. The outworking of this is manifested in the few now taking on the work of the many. And much of the outreach and ministry of the church has fallen by the wayside because of a lack of human resources being mobilised. The resources mentioned are not missing because there are not fewer Christians to conduct the work. No, there are even more Christians now than perhaps there has ever been in the whole of all the generations that have gone before us. The reason for it, the reason for this imbalance in the thinking perhaps of us all that has developed over the years and a lack of vision and motivation and the result is literally people perishing all around about us daily. William Booth once said, and I quote him, let the business of the world take care of itself. My business is to get the world saved. If this involves the standing still of the looms and the shutting up of the factories and the staying of the sailing of the ships, let them all stand still. When we have got everybody converted, they can go on again and we shall be able to keep going, things going then by working half the time and have the rest to spend in loving one another and worshipping God. You know, I for one, and I hope for you, are challenged by his words. They were spoken a long time ago, hence talking of looms, but they still resonate in my heart and I hope in your heart today. The question is, however, do they resonate in our hearts as we have listened to those words by William Booth? We, for the most part, you see, have forgotten what we have been saved from and the place wherein we now find ourselves. We are now children of God, hallelujah, living under his grace. And why? Because so much of so many of the sermons we hear today are about self-help. And so much of the worship that many in the church today indulge in are from songs that promote victory and warfare, self-glorification and position. Quite the opposite of that which was fundamental to sermons and songs, stroke hymns of the past. William Booth again said, most Christians would like to send their recruits to Bible college for five years. I would like to send them to hell for five minutes. That would do more than anything else to prepare them for a lifetime of compassionate ministry. Now don't please misunderstand, misread me. I'm not saying that the songs we sing today are, are not uplifting. They certainly are. I'm not saying that the sermons we listen to today are not needed. They most certainly are. However, I as a leader and other leaders are responsible for promoting, instigating and being involved themselves in the field work of evangelism and the foundational work of installing through the hope of the help of the Holy Spirit a renewal of God's hunger for the lost. If you are a pastor and you are a leader, and you never engage in personal witness and in personal soul winning and in personal leading others to Christ, then you are failing in the most basic and fundamental aspect of your salvation and your calling in God. As the people of God, we have an immense privilege of being called by the Lord to collaborate with him. And as our text says, dwell with the king for his work and to be engaged in his business. What a privilege. Hallelujah, that is. 
and how great that really is for all of us to know and experience. Now, do I say that because amongst other things, amongst other callings, I am an evangelist? Well, yes, of course I do. But I hope that that is not the only reason for it. What a phenomenal privilege we have. We were once lost and hopeless sinners without God, without hope and heaven before us and only hell on our horizons. But now, hallelujah, praise God, we are saved. We are saved and sanctified. We are saved, sanctified and redeemed. We are saved, sanctified, redeemed and gloriously set free from the tyranny of sin. Praise God. And although and because of our glorious and magnificent Saviour, it is all through him, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is king in every sense of the word. And we're told that in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 15. He is declared to be greater than any earthly king because it there states he is the king of kings. In Matthew 2 and verse 2, we discover that Jesus was born to be a king. And even at his death on the cross, the inscription that we are told of in John 19 and verse 19 spoke of his kingship. And it is this king who calls you and calls me as the redeemed to serve him. What a privilege that is. In the natural sense, if we were to be serving an earthly monarch, we would simply be servants. There under normal circumstances would be no degree of intimacy or closeness between ourselves and the monarch. But not so with our king. He may be the ruler of the universe. He may be the one who upholds all things by the word of his power. However, he is also the one who never leaves us or forsakes us. He is the one who sticks closer than any brother. And he is the one who dwells in us by the Holy Spirit. And we are enabled to dwell in him. And I tell you, my friends, today, it is not possible to get much closer than that. And thus, in light of all that, let's now take a closer look at our text and see what the Lord, by his Holy Spirit, may want to convey to our hearts. Number one, all who dwell with the king must work for him, the king. I mentioned earlier, right at the beginning, that there was a saying, saved to serve. And I will now reiterate it. Although there has grown up an imbalance concerning it, the truth yet remains that we are still saved primarily to serve. And there is no other way for us to be in a real place of blessing and a real place of growth and have any real sense of victory unless we are prepared to serve him the King of Kings, our Saviour. Now you might say to me today, and it would be absolutely right, we are saved to serve, amen to that, my brother. However, are we really serving the Lord? Let me ask you a rhetorical question, which I hope you will engage in in your mind and in your thinking just now. The question is, what are we actually engaged in within the church of Jesus Christ for and with him and secondarily what do our hands and feet and our energies and talents actually get exercised in within the household of faith in the parable that Jesus told in Matthew 20 and verse 6 about the owner of an estate needing workers for his farm in verse 6, it says, why do you stand here idle 
all day. And we must, as the people of God, in light of the great things that Jesus has done for us, avoid this at all costs being said of us. Jesus is looking for and rightly requires, as I mentioned in our previous session, workers are required, not shirkers. And we are, each one of us, young or old, mature or immature in the faith, required to work for our master Jesus and be engaged actively and conscientiously in the king's business. The clarion call is going out to the church today. And I, I, I want to blast that call even louder in what I'm saying today. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? As found in Isaiah 6 and verse 8, the first part of that verse. But it is interesting to note that before Isaiah could respond with the words and say, here am I, send me, in Isaiah 8 and the last part of that verse, he had a problem that he and all of us have to respond to. You see, Isaiah declared, Woe to me, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Does that sound familiar? And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. You see, I said earlier, we for the most part have forgotten what we have been saved from and the place wherein we now find ourselves. And that place is as children of God and children of God living under the grace of God moment by moment and in a place where there is set before us a table, a banqueting table for us to enjoy as we are told in Psalm 23. Isaiah standing in the Lord's presence knew just this even though he was not standing in the same covenantal position as we do today. He was painfully aware of his sin and he was broken about it in exactly the same way as Job was in Job 42 and verse 6 and as Peter was in Luke 5 and verse 8. When they were confronted with the presence of the Lord, they found themselves broken and aware of their sin. And I trust that that might be said of us as well, that when we are in the presence of the Lord, we are painfully aware of the sin that still resides within us. But praise God, there is a cleansing of our sin through Jesus Christ, who shed his blood for us. But you see, God was preparing Isaiah. God was preparing Job. God was preparing Peter for their cleansing, yes, but also for their commission. And God is doing exactly the same for you, my brothers and sisters, and for me this very day. Now we could say, well, I'm not very talented. I don't have a lot of giftings. What can I do? The text tells us exactly what we can do. The text reveals that there are many ways in which we can serve the Lord. You see, the passage speaks of those who were potters and those who dwelt amongst the plants and the hedges. And in the king's employ, there would have been hundreds of tasks that were conducted daily. There were musicians, watchmen, courtiers, those who cleaned the palace and many, many more. Likewise, within the household of faith, there are countless tasks and opportunities, I might say, for the community of God's people, for their hands and their energies to be engaged in. One thing that would have been obvious in the king's palace, amongst the royal household, would have been that if they saw that a job needing doing, they would not have left it undone simply because the king had not come to them personally and intimately and asked them. No, they would have seen the need 
and responded accordingly. When Worldwide Christian Ministries came into being some 12, nearly 13 years ago, it was exactly that that brought it into being. When God reminded me of that time in the Acts of the Apostles when people came to others and said, come over and help us. And that clarion call to my heart by the Spirit of God has remained ever since. And I have been trying to outwork that clarion call to my heart in many various areas of the world and many nations where I have committed myself to the heartfelt cry of the people of God and leaders within various denominations and churches to come over and help them. And the Worldwide Christian Ministries website found at www.worldwidechristianministries.org and also on our YouTube channel at www.youtube forward slash C forward slash Albert M. Martin WWCM have been there to try and work resources into various parts of the world and various churches. Those two areas of the website and the YouTube site you will find at the end in the final bit of this video and this time together. And so he would not come going back to what I was saying to us individually and intimately to fulfill a task for him. No, he will expect us to recognize the need and to respond accordingly. Remember what Spurgeon said? The new life within him tells him what the work is. And if our bodies have, as Romans 12 and verse 1 says, pre been presented as the Lord as a living sacrifice, then they are no longer our own. They are bought, as Scripture said, with a price and are therefore at his disposal. In 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 and 5, we read, There distinctive varieties and distributions of endowments and vary. And there are distinctive varieties of service ministration. But it is the same Lord that is served. And they are there so that we may aid the Lord in his work. You may ask of me, when can we do it and where? Well, the answer comes back very, very easily and simply, we can do it right now and right where we are. We love to think, you see, that if we were in some foreign mission field or some other avenue of employment, then we could serve the Lord far better. And there are those around who move from one place to another place, constantly trying to find the will of God for their lives, missing out on what God wants them to do when they are called to serve the Lord right where they are. And so if we were in some foreign mission field or some avenue of, uh, of employment, we might be saying, well, then we can serve the Lord far better. But that is not necessarily the case, for we are called to serve the Lord where we are and where we are right now. And so number two is this. All who work for the king must dwell with him, the king. When the Lord began his work here on earth, what was the first thing he did? That's right, he chose 12 ordinary men and he sent them out to work for him. Let me read to you what it says in Luke 6, 12 to 13. It was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples to him, that is the 12, and chose the twelve of them, whom he also named apostles. What we know to be true about Jesus is that he chose ordinary and unrefined men. They were the commonest of the common. They were from rural areas, farmers and fishermen. Christ purposely 
passed over the elite, the aristocratic, and influential men of his society and chose mostly the men that were considered to be of the dregs of society in that day. That's how it has always been in God's economy. He exalts the humble brothers and sisters and he lays low those who are proud. And may God, and I say this of my own heart as I speak to you today, May God protect us and make us sensitive to pride when it rises in our hearts. For pride will destroy every hope of ever being fruitful for God. And let us humbly, when we discover it, come before God and ask him to forgive us and cleanse us and help us to walk humbly with our God. However, notice here that Jesus didn't just to choose the 12 and then the next day send them out. No, he spent time with them and they spent time with him. And the reason for this was that Jesus wanted them to be prepared for the task ahead. And brothers and sisters, that is exactly what Jesus wants to do and is doing for you and I. He is spending time with us and he desires us to spend time with him so that we may be prepared for the task of head and we may be also strengthened for the tasks that we are already engaged in. He desired to train them to be disciples, to be followers of him. And that's exactly what he did. They didn't go to seminar or Bible college. And let me say right here and now that there is a place for that. And I would encourage that of you. I went to Bible school for two years and it was invaluable, not only for the training that I received, but it was invaluable for what was ingrained in my heart and in my spirit. And that has been there since 1970, right up until now, 2022. But the disciples didn't go to Bible college. No, they had on the job training. They learned how by doing the work. They were thrown in as it were to the deep end, but all the time he, Jesus, collaborated with them. And isn't it wonderful that the Bible says to us that we are workers together with God, hallelujah. We may feel today that we are unequipped for the task. And I have to say that quite often that is exactly how I feel. And in many respects, you know, that is a really good place to be. Remember what Isaiah said to us earlier. We may feel that we're not up to any specific job for him. And naturally so, that could be true. But let me say right now, my brothers and sisters, we are not dealing with the natural, but we are dealing with the supernatural. And for a supernatural task, we are being equipped by God. And we have been called ambassadors for Christ. And we have an ambassadorial role to fulfill for Christ and in the kingdom that he has sent us in to serve him within. But as ambassadors, we could never do it effectively or powerfully without his enabling. And that's why, hallelujah, in Acts 1 and verse 8, we read the words of the Lord Jesus, where it says, Listen, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you know, he gives the Holy Spirit to enable and to empower and to strengthen us. And as he was with his disciples, my brothers and sisters, so he will be with you and with me. Praise God. God, we are not alone. We are workers together with God. And he says, faint not. Why? Because he will carry us through. And even if our task is difficult at this moment, 
even if we feel we are failing even if we feel we just cannot go on and the task is too great and the opposition is always against us remember you are not and I am not forsaken for he never forsakes us and he is with us to carry us on through into victory and into a life of fruitfulness and a life of fruit that will remain. Be encouraged, my brothers and sisters, as I tell you that. Let that be within the centre of your heart and thinking and let it carry you through. In conclusion, let me read to you something that Smith Wigglesworth once said. He said this, the Lord wants all saved people to receive power from on high. Power to witness, power to act, power to live and power to show forth the divine manifestation of God within us. The power of God will take you out of your own plans and put you into the plan of God. You will be unmantled and divested of that which is purely of yourself and put into divine order. The Lord will change you and put his mind where yours was and thus enable you to have the mind of Christ. Instead of you laboring according to your own plan, it will be God working in and through you to do his own good pleasure through the power of the Holy Spirit within. Someone has said that you are no longer good until you have your eye knocked out. Christ must reign within and the life in the Holy Ghost means at all times the subjection of yours or our will to make way for the working out of the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And I hope that you might go over that statement a few times and allow it to percolate in your spirit until it takes a grip. But what I say to you is this, that the Holy Spirit is upon you as he is upon me. We have an anointing, the scripture tells us, that abides. And right now, at this very moment, the Spirit of God's anointing is upon you to make you victorious, to take you out of defeat, to take you out of discouragement, to take you out of unfruitfulness and to put you into a new place of victory, a place of encouragement, a place of fruitfulness. And that Spirit's anointing is upon you, my brothers and sisters, right now. And I'm going to pray for you just in a moment. And as I pray for you, I trust that you will join with me and you will raise your hearts and raise your minds, maybe even raise your hands as I pray and say to God Almighty, let this be true of me today, my Saviour and my Lord, and let this be true of me in the days to come. I trust wherever you may be throughout the world that the kingdom of God might be extended and that our respective church communities will be significantly encouraged by a newfound enthusiasm to serve our Saviour, our Master and our Lord. And as I say, I'm going to pray for you now and let's bow our heads wherever we may be and let's open our hearts and minds and let's have a willingness of heart as I pray. Heavenly Father, as I pray for myself and I pray for my brothers and sisters, Lord, I pray that you may find in me a heart that is willing. You might find in me a mind that is receptive. You might find in me a will that has been softened by the Holy Spirit to do exactly what you want me to do. And Lord, I for one right now surrender my life afresh to you and I say have your way, have your will. Let your sovereign plan be outworked within my life, whatever that may be. And I call upon you, brothers and sisters, right now to raise your hand if that is your prayer and to say to the Lord right now, 
Lord, I give my life afresh to you. I want you to reign as sovereign God within my life. And I am determined from this time forward to enjoy my commission as a worker and to enjoy the privilege of being a worker for Christ. Make me fruitful from this day forward. Make my fruit remain. And Lord Jesus, above everything, be glorified in my life. Amen. And I say to you, my brothers and sisters, may you be encouraged today and as you go onwards in your journey of faith. Amen.